I'd like you to meet Gigi. Gigi is one of the Missouri 500. Those are the 500 dogs rescued from the largest dog fighting raid in US history. Her ears, her scars, they're a reminder of what she went through, but they don't define her. Gigi is so much more. She's a cross country road tripper, she's a hiker, she's a beach goer, she's a camper. Gigi is also a certified therapy dog. She now gets to do what she does best, bring smiles to those who need them most. And her favorite place to visit is the VA hospital. Gigi is also a pit bull. And because she's a pit bull, there are hundreds of cities and towns in this country where Gigi isn't welcome. These are places that have breed-specific legislation, and in these places, an animal control agent or an officer can remove and even kill a family's dog for no other reason than the officer believes the dog matches certain physical characteristics that the locality has deemed undesirable. A dog that has no history of aggression, a dog that spends his days playing with the neighborhood kids and probably lets the house cat boss him around. A dog that could be a certified therapy dog. It doesn't matter. He looks a certain way. A way that we've been taught to fear. A way that we've been told is dangerous. And that's all it takes to end his life. There is nothing specific about breed-specific legislation. These laws will list a few breeds and then say, any dog with the physical characteristics or appearance of these breeds, or say, any dog commonly known as or commonly referred to as pit bull, think about that for a second. A legal definition, a definition that literally determines life or death for a family's dog, defines the illegality as something that could be referred to as a pit bull. Even though controlled studies have never been able to identify the pit bull type breed group as disproportionately dangerous. Breed studies from all over the world, none show that this type or look of dog is any more likely to be dangerous or aggressive. Right here in the US, we have the American Temperament Test Society, an independent organization that tests thousands of dogs, hundreds of breeds, in a variety of situations, and their average passing score for all dogs, all breeds, on their temperament tests is 83%. For the pit bull type breeds, those breeds we saw listed earlier, and other breeds commonly mistaken for pit bulls because of their physical characteristics, they're big and muscular, every single one of them scores above average. Some other common breeds didn't do as well. But none of this is to say that one breed group is a good dog and one breed group is a bad dog. These are all good numbers. The truth is there's very little variation in aggressiveness between breeds. The greatest difference is actually between the larger breeds and the smaller breeds, where the larger breeds tend to be less aggressive. And it's important to remember that even dogs who share a lot of DNA, so not just dogs of the same breed, but even siblings from the same litter, can still be very different because dogs are individuals. Dogs aren't their breed. Dogs aren't their past. Dogs aren't their scars. It's not how they're raised, right? Gigi's proof of that. She wasn't raised to be a therapy dog. She was just finally given the opportunity and the environment to be who she truly is who she's always been. Dogs are individuals. The size of my dog's head, the width of his chest, any other physical characteristic he may exhibit no more determines his personality than the color of my hair determines mine. Proponents of breed-specific legislation will say, well, we have these statistics that say that pit bulls bite more. Well, no, you don't. You have a data set that was compiled from media reports, and the authors who published that data set, the Centers for Disease Control and the American Veterinary Medical Association, explicitly said 
that their data could not be used to infer breed-specific risk because we don't have total numbers of each breed living in the country. And why does it matter that this data was compiled from media reports? Because we know that the media both overrepresents pit bulls, pit bulls make juicier headlines, and misidentifies pit bulls. Studies show about a 25% success rate visually identifying mixed breed dogs as pit bulls when compared to the dog's DNA, even among animal professionals. We do have some statistics, though. A recent study found that dog bites have several factors in common. And breed was not one of them. The study concluded what we already knew, that breed is irrelevant. So what were some of these factors? The chaining of dogs. Dogs kept isolated from positive human interaction. These are your yard dogs and your guard dogs. Dogs not spayed or neutered. An owner history of abuse, neglect, and mismanagement. And a failure to supervise or intervene when appropriate, especially when kids are involved. So we have these factors. We know that this is where we should be focusing for safer communities, and all the experts agree. All of these organizations tell us banning a breed or type or look of dog is at best ineffective at keeping communities safe. In practice, they cost a lot of taxpayer money to implement and defend. They encourage ownership by substandard owners, they just make the bad guys want these dogs even more. And they're just killing good family dogs. That's why nearly 20 states already prohibit their cities and towns from passing breed-specific legislation. That's why the federal government has spoken out against breed-specific legislation. That's why we have federal protection for pit bull service dogs, no matter where they live, even if they live in a town that has breed-specific legislation. Locations that have infamous bans, that have had these bans for decades, can't show that their cities are any safer for them. They can't make the connection because it just doesn't work. So we know there's no scientific evidence for the idea that pit bull type dogs are any more aggressive than others. We know that these laws don't work, so why? Why do people still try to pass them? Well, when the media started covering dog fighting raids in the 70s and 80s, they didn't focus on the sadistic nature of the people involved in these operations. They didn't focus on the acts of torture committed against these dogs to get them angry and frustrated and pained enough to fight because dogs don't want to fight. It's completely against their nature. Dogs are social animals, and so many of these dogs die brutal deaths because they refuse to fight. But instead, the media focused on the monster dogs coming out of these raids, and that's when the myths started. They have locking jaws. They don't feel pain. They have a stronger bite than any other animal. This media hysteria caused these dogs to no longer be considered dogs. They were now something else. They were some, some new category of beast. To the extent that there was a time in Miami where you could own a tiger and not a pit bull. But these were victims. Victims. And this tiny fraction of the millions of pit bulls in this country got all the media attention, and this tiny fraction, with all their made-up superpowers, now represented the millions of blocky-headed, big-chested, pit bull-looking dogs living perfectly normal, peaceful lives in loving homes. And these everyday families, with their everyday family dogs, are the ones who suffer the most from these laws, the ones who suffer the most from these fears, from these perceptions. Something I always find interesting. If you read these reports, when officers enter the premises of a suspected dog fighting operation, the dogs don't growl or snap or lunge. Some might cower in fear, but most are just longing for safe human touch. Even testimony from people who have witnessed dog fighting say that when a dog is pulled from the ring by its owner, 
It's never aggressive with its owner. It licks and leans into its owner. The same owner who earlier that day drugged and brutalized that dog to get him in the fight. And he did that for money. He did that for greed, for power, for ego. We're talking about dogs who have seen the worst of human nature, who have been betrayed over and over again by people who have no reason to trust us. And yet, not only do they still want to be with us, they want to heal us. They turn around and become therapy dogs. They visit our elderly. They heal our veterans suffering from PTSD. They give our kids confidence in reading programs. Even with all the odds stacked against them, all the fears, all the misconceptions, these dogs break all of that down like gentle giants, not with force, but with love and patience and trust. My mom recently asked me, how does he know? And what she was referring to was how these dogs know when we need them. How they get just a little bit closer on those days that were extra hard. These dogs change us. Their capacity for forgiveness, for starting over, for unconditional love changes us, makes us want to be better, do better. Speak up. Fight injustice. So often when I'm walking my dogs, they'll find a stranger to make friends with, and they'll do their wiggle and their waggle and all that. And the people will say, oh, they're so sweet. What kind of dogs are those? And when I say pit bulls, there's usually that split second of panic, and then that turns into surprise and then amazement. And they'll say, Wow, I didn't know pit bulls could be so sweet. And I'll say, have you met any? So if you haven't yet, go meet a pit bull. Find yourself a big, blocky-headed guy and spend some time with him. You'll see he's not so scary. You'll see he'll lick your face, and he is probably going to want his butt scratched because he's just a dog. He doesn't understand why people fear him. And soon neither will you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.